what happened to Toys R Us? What happened to Circuit City? What happened to Radio Shack? I mean, I know a lot of it is blamed on e-commerce. All of them, when I look at in the research that we did, they all had issues that had also nothing to do with the online aspect of it. It's a very non-glamorous back-end story of good old-fashioned inventory mismanagement. You take some Amazon sellers that are embracing new technology. Who's using AI more than anyone out there? We are, you know, we're using it in every aspect of our business, customer service, but we also do a lot of it with many different processes that we do inside. And but when I take this excitement back to a reverse logistics warehouse, they've heard of AI. They have not tried it. AI is so cutting edge that it's going to take them a long time to catch up. On average, the really good Amazon on sellers at the end of the day after they pay every single expense the really good ones you're listening to welcome to what the tech your gateway to business strategies and tech secrets shaping today's workplace hello there it's rolando over here coming to you and of course, Dave Kelly, happy to be here. Well, Hondo, what the tech is going on? Man, I don't, man, there's a lot of tech and tech related and so much happening right now. It's both exciting and frightening at the same time in the, the this, this particular time we're living in, really. You know, you know, so much is going on um, that, you know, it seems like you know, a little bit of a data overload with everything happening. And it's so fast, the pace, right? No, it's way too fast. You know, it makes you think of simpler times. You know, think back to when you were a child. We didn't have, we didn't have all this information overload. We had retail stores. We had different types of community. Um, no cell phones to, no cell you know, phones. give it to be going off and notifying us every every couple of <laughs> seconds or minutes. Like right now I'm talking to you and something's going off on my computer screen right now, uh, distracting me from from the conversation I'm having with you. It's just something we did not have. No uh, do you, you know, when you went to college, Dave, I'm just reminded about something. When my first day in college in the dorms. Um, we came in early, you know, playing football, you know, we come in way before most of the students to, to do our, um, two days and trainings and all that, that type of stuff preseason. And I remember the, uh, floor residential advisor, you know, somebody that's on the floor there that helps you out. They said, you know, you, you're, you're privileged because this is the first year we put phones in everybody's dorm room. I was like, yo, that's awesome. That's crazy. Then the, Somebody could, before it was the community phone, right? And everybody, well, for it, it, it was the community phone. Everybody on the floor in the dorm shared that phone. So if somebody got a hold of you or tried to get in touch with you, they had to call that phone. It could have phone been on the end of the hallway. Hey, it's, it's your mom, Rolando. Come down to the, you know, the community phone that hung on the wall. She's over here on the phone for you. She wants to talk to you. And then meanwhile, she already spoke with three. Three folks that live in the house, like Jason is such a nice boy. <laughs> and now instant communications from anywhere in the world, right? You know, it's crazy. There was there's a, there was a salesperson behind, you know, those phones, those phones that got deployed into every room. You know, that was a probably a pretty Vodavi. big project for someone. Vodavi that was, was ours. Outside. Yeah, in ours it was Vadavi. I don't even know if Vadavi's still around. They may have gotten purchased, but uh, a lot of those phone manufacturers have gone away, which is kind of what uh, gets into what we're talking about. You know, doing the thing of selling physical products is not an easy thing, whether no. you are an online retailer or you sell offline, right? You know, and you have a storefront uh, in the real, in the non cyber world, right? And people walk into your store uh, and look at the goods and touch them. And, you know, that's, that got me thinking about how did some of these brands that you and I grew up with, um, you know, like Circuit City, you could walk into the store. I bought many things at Circuit City. Radio Shack bought a lot of accessories over time. And well, like toy stores, you know, one of my favorite, I just remember as a kid, it was the toy store, you know, like yeah. Toys R Us. Toys R Us. Toys R Us, man. man. And I still remember that. Ori, do we have any footage on Toys R Us that we can? 
we can reminisce a little bit about, and I'm sure that for, for the folks that are probably younger and may not even know who Toys R Us is, let's share a little bit of that. Uh, and so if you've got your headphones on, listen to us with headphones. You're going to be able to hear this much better. Go ahead, roll that, Ori. I don't want to grow up. Find a toy to wreck it. They got a million toys and toys to wreck that I can play with. I don't want to grow up. I'm a toy to wreck it. They got the best for so much less. You really flip your lid. From bike to train to video game. It's the biggest toy store there is. She wins. I don't want to grow up. Cause baby, if I did, I couldn't be a toy to wreck it. Okay. Aww. Hooray! I want to be a Toys R Us kid. I'd like to go I'm... back to that, man. Man, there's no way. I, there's no way Toys R Us. Could you have imagined that Toys R Us is a store you could not walk into today oh, when no. you were a kid? Okay? Well, man, I remember when my parents would talk about going to the mall and the... So they would, they wanted to bring you school shopping. You know, you really didn't, you know, when you were a little kid, you didn't really want to go school shopping. It was more of a chore. But then my parents, at least, they'd say, listen, we'll stop over at Toys R Us. You want to go to Toys R Us? You know, we'll stop in there. And I, when I was a kid going to, going to the mall with the hopes of going to Toys R Us, that was like the carnival. It's like the mascot. They showed the mascot briefly. Who was the mascot? Yeah, Jeffrey. For it got to be Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Jeffrey was, the giraffe. So we were talking about the mascots. You know, I thought Jeffrey might actually show up at that store, but mm -hmm. just the idea of going there, you know, was just that. I feel like that's just nostalgia. It's things that kids really aren't getting these days. You know, right. that a feeling of walking into a store where. It was for you. I mean, that was for kids. That was for kids. What happened? What happened to Toys R Us? What happened to Circuit City? What happened to Radio Shack? I mean, I know a lot of it is blamed on, hey, you know what? E-commerce, e-commerce. But I think some of these companies, they went out of business, you know, before Amazon was all the hype. Well, let's, let's, let's I've got the actual uh, dates that were at least when they declared bankruptcy. Circuit City, tw 2008. Radio Shack 2015 and Toys R Us in 2017. All of them have tried to make a comeback one way or another. But you know, Amazon didn't go online until I believe it was 1999. Uh, and over time they did add more products and then and more online retailers came came into the space. Yep. But all of them, when I look at uh, and the research that we did, they all had issues that had also nothing to do with the online aspect of it it's a very non-glamorous back-end story of good old-fashioned inventory mismanagement yeah as well as those other factors that we talked about but it was interesting to find out that circuit city had issues with inventory um radio shack also ran into issues with inventory and Toys R Us was no exception in this list also had issues with inventory. And, you know, Dave, I'm reminded of a story um, that Damon John had for one of the Shark Tank, Shark Tank con contestants, if I could say that, Shark Tank contestants. Uh, and he passed on this contestant because he knew that the climb was going to be very difficult when it came to managing inventory. This particular woman was, uh, she had a very interesting line of bathing suits and he passed on her because then he outlined all the challenges specifically about how to manage all the different SKUs and what happens with returns and year two and year three and year four. Clothing. I mean, Damon's going to know about the clothing industry, right? Exactly. He knows about the clothing and he talked about very matter of fact on how are you going to go about not just managing this, but having a roadmap on years beyond one, two, three, or four, because as you could throw money at this, and now instead of a $1 million problem in inventory, as you grow, you have a $10 million problem, and then a $40 million in year four or five and six. And so as you keep going in time, if you aren't doing an, not just a good job, but an excellent job of managing that inventory, it all of a sudden 
becomes one warehouse. You got to manage two warehouses, three warehouses. And a lot of those warehouses have products that are mixed in that are either old, discontinued, um, to be liquidated kind of merchandise. And now your profits get smaller, get smaller, <laughs> cut and get cut. And, and that's what he was trying to convey to this right. to woman, that the profits get eaten up by inventory. And I, we could have cited several more companies that are brand names that also had this big issue with inventory. Uh, and it's uh, it's not really a sexy and glamorous thing to talk about, Dave. No. But it's interesting that that thread repeated itself among 10 other companies that I had researched that inventory played a role in the demise of these companies. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we have a lot of those challenges. You know, I've, I have asked other organizations that are in our space how they manage product returns. We're not getting it. It's almost like they're like, yeah, it's kind of like this afterthought. We, I've asked some of our partners, how do other <laughs> partners of yours that are doing what we're doing, how do they manage their returns? They don't know. They don't know. So I, so I think that's why we're trying, why we thought it'd be a good idea to have this conversation is like Damon, he may have thought that that product was phenomenal, hot seller, right price point, was going to fit in with the trends. But even if you know that product is hot and sexy, if you don't have some sort of a management with that back end, with your either inventory supply mm -hmm. or what do you do with the inventory of returns? I mean, he was smart enough to back right out of that. He'd already been down that river. He'd oh, already yeah. gone, gone down that path. And, and whether, it, <clears throat> so it's, whether you're in fashion, whether you're in electronics, uh, whether you're in some other space, anything that deals with a, with a physical product, there's a percentage that are always going to not like it, going to re, you know return it for X Y breaks, and it gets damaged, and you have to account for that because if if you look at the profits, I'm told that um, on average, the really good Amazon sellers at the end of the day, after they pay every single expense, the really good ones are doing twenty percent profit margin, twenty percent. That's, That's nothing fair. to get crazy about. So if you're doing a excellent job, 20% is what at the end of the day you take home. And so if inventory eats up into that in year number two, three, four, you go from 20 to 19. And sometimes it just kind of creeps that way because there isn't the oversight. There isn't the data. There isn't the analytics. There isn't the system in place. And that's what we've learned over the years. Uh, and, you know, we spend quite a bit of time uh, a week discussing it, analyzing it here, this, uh, having inter uh, having intergroup discussions with customer service, with our logistics people, uh, with our warehouses, with our fulfillment partners all along every week. Because that's what it, I would say, Dave, that's what it takes. Because there's data that's outside of your own bubble oh, yeah. that you just don't know or don't see. <clears throat> but if you don't have the information, like, um, you know, there's a product that, that got returned and it's piling up at the reverse logistics warehouse over six or eight months. And this happened to us uh, a couple of years ago. We went to our facility that handles the reverse logistics and they had cartons of stuff that were returned and we were like what happened right why is this just sitting here you remember that dave i do i do remember that and you know we were chatting earlier about you know reverse logistics it's challenging working with warehouses because you take you take some amazon sellers that are embracing new technology you know who's using ai more than anyone out there we we are you know we're using it in every aspect of our business customer service but we also do a lot of it with um we, we've been using it for forecasting been using it with just many different processes that we do inside internally but when i take this excitement back to a reverse logistics warehouse they've heard of ai they have not tried it and 
AI is so cutting edge that it's going to take them a long time to catch up. So we're trying, here we are, we are a modern e-commerce, a full service business. And you know, some of the folks on the 3PL, the reverse logistics side, they're they're just they're, they're still in the world of spreadsheets, you know, data right. that really that we can't really crunch it as deep as we'd really like to do that. And that's kind of a challenge. It, 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 indeed, because what you need in order to manage products, not just manage, Dave, but to excel at it, you need the right kind of data and you need it in real time. And quite often, and I'm surprised, I'm, I'm astounded by how a lot of organizations don't have the information they need at their fingertips to understand, yes, yeah, SKU XYZ, we have a thousand units sitting here and we haven't sold one of those in six months because those are returned items. And so having that information at your fingertips is valuable. And then having the plan of action, which I think where the breakdown happens, um, I saw something the other day where something like 60% of data is not utilized by organizations. Hmm. So it's just there. It's not being put into any action. It's not visible because we are drowning in data, so to speak. So what, what, I, what we've been able to do is put the data we need in front of the right people. And a lot of times the people that hold that data or have that in front of them then communicate about, hey, you know, we, we're starting to see a blip in this. And then that information gets shared with the different teams to then take actions. Because if you have stuff that's coming back and now you understand, oh, with a, the, the manufacturer put the wrong label on it. All right. Now you know how to correct that problem. But quite often in a lot of organizations, especially as you get larger with more management and more SKUs, that's not my department. That's not my problem, right? And over time, incrementally, one SKU, two SKUs, three SKUs, five SKUs, and then you get this big problem of what do we do with all this stuff? Okay, let's liquidate it. And well, sometimes it's hard to liquidate merchandise that's old. Um, sure it's not, not fashionable if you're in the fashion industry sometimes. Uh, if, it's, if it's electronics, it, it may be you know, too old. Um, or there may not be enough demand. So you may never collect on it. You may get pennies on the dollars. That's why systems are important. And I know for us, one of the things that we've been able to do that's worked is to try to connect as many of the data points to a central source of truth. So we have a, a repository of where all the orders funnel in, where all the inventory information comes in where all the uh, inventory going out, because that's just as important to know where is it going out as well as it coming in. And that lives in one centralized location. And then people have access to the different points so that they can understand, whoa, we've got an issue here. We've got pallets sitting here and piling up. Um, otherwise, you know, Dave, these a lot of the warehouses, and we work, I, I wanna say what at least 19 different warehouses one w in some form or another mm -hmm. um, that is doing either reverse logistics or fulfillment for us. And when you don't have the visibility into those facilities and what inventory is there, things could get really out of hand very fast. <laughs> and they yeah. all have their different systems. They all have their different ways of fulfilling, of shipping, of cutoff times. And, and the more SKUs that you manage, the more difficult it is. I mean, I think about what Walmart's been able to do. You know, they're a physical retailer. They're also online now. They are known for their fulfillment and logistic systems. And they've invested and they keep in reinvesting because things change over time. And to excel in the space of physical goods where inventory chews up cash flow like it's nobody's business, it's the one area where you can exert the greatest control over as, a, as an enterprise, as a company, even as a startup. Because inventory, for us, it's the most expensive uh, line item when it comes to expenses. 
And yep. I would venture to say that it's like that for most folks that are, uh, whether they're starting out, whether they're going online. And I would I would say um, that this is probably the same for those three brands, Circuit City, Radio Shack, and Toys R Us, had to be one of the biggest sources of, from a cost perspective, that that they were that they were holding on to on the books. Um, sure. And so with, without a really good way of having visibility, of having the people in place, and having um, these systems work together, because they, you know, somebody's on one system at this warehouse, and then another one over here, and then another over here. Um, you know, I'm reminded of the one of the facilities that we worked at, uh, with, um, Dave. Um, they weren't uh, able to keep track of the different bundles that we have, for example. I remember. And their system, and it was a very elaborate system, didn't account for all the different variations of the bundles. So we had to set something up with them so that as we created bundles, their system recognized all the different SKUs, they knew exactly what needed to go out the door, um, and we were able to get over this hurdle of why why are we having an issue with bundles over there? It should be straightforward. Oh yeah, but we can only do one bundle at a time in the system. Well, <laughs> that's a problem, right? Um, and I, I I venture to say that a lot of other companies run into that, whether uh, from the te technology perspective, maybe the system they're on doesn't have that, but there are ways around that. Um, there's some uh, third-party applications as well that can be brought in-house, uh, brought to bear. Uh, but it does takes it does take somebody that is definitely going to be on top of it if it's, you have a project person or a technologist because it just requires it. And I think and that's probably why Walmart has excelled. You know, they keep reinvesting into their system. Mm. Rolando, um, I want to I want to go back to when you started on Amazon. So a lot of Amazon, most Amazon sellers, we start small right? Have a few listings out there. Um, maybe we're doing our own shipping and logistics. We're just, we're just starting up. What was it like for the first few, few months or few years when you started doing it on your own? And when did, when did you look into other like 3PL resources, like a returns warehouse? When did that come about? How were you doing it before a returns warehouse? And when did you say, listen, we need to bring someone else into the mix? So uh, at the very beginning, it was purely dropship. So dropship, for those that are not familiar with it, some, uh, some, uh, some other facility has that inventory. And we purchase that inventory as it's sold. And they, being the dropshipper or this facility, sends it to the customer. So that was our modus of operandi for a long time. As that um, started growing, then there were times where we would get special deals on inventory. And so we, I, I would take that and put it in my garage. <laughs> and so there was the start of this whole fulfillment fulfilled by Rolando within Global <laughs> Tech, right? Yeah. And so I had to get a I had to understand how to, I never shipped stuff before, right? So I opened a ship station account. I had the wrong printer for a long time. And I, then I, somebody said, you need a zebra printer. What the hell is a zebra printer? Well, the zebra printer is this printer where the labels, it spits it out and they don't smudge. The ink doesn't come off. Mm -hmm. Oh, boom. That was like, boom, a light bulb moment. Zebra printers. Okay, so we were zebra printers. Then slowly over time, the garage was a place to, to put the stuff that got too small. And at that, that point was where, hmm, and we're getting deals on stuff. We're growing. We got to, there's no way I could stay on top of this by myself. And that's when the, the journey began on how do, how do we best get the inventory we need to the customers as fast as possible? And then that's when I started looking at um, warehouses that could do that for us. Now, a lot of people at this point in the story, they will say, well, it's time to move into an own warehouse, my own warehouse, my own facility. And for some, that's going to work. But mm -hmm. I got to tell you, 
there's a lot of reasons not to do it, especially early on. If you're not a logistics champion, if shipping is not your forte, if the prospect of, of today, people not being available to come uh, to the warehouse and managing people that don't show up, this is a very real problem. Yeah. Um, and I know that there are a lot of sellers out there that want to jump in, in both feet into the warehouse space. And I know a lot of others that have gotten out of it because of that. Managing a warehouse is no joke, Dave. And, yeah, I wouldn't think so. And, and in today's economic environment, boy, you know, there's a challenge to have people, period, people. It doesn't matter what state you're in. And having people manage uh, and run a warehouse for you efficiently without issues, right? Uh, and I'm sure if, if you're listening to this and you in the warehousing industry, you probably understand that, yep. That's a big challenge. So I, I decided, let me use a facility like a 3PL, a, th a third-party shipping logistics provider that can do all of that. They handle all the people. They make sure they're staffed. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about buying a warehouse, the capital required. And that's the thing. The dollars you have, you want to try to reinvest that back into the business. You can do that by acquiring a warehouse and you, you, you manage everything from A to Z, if we were to use the Amazon words on that, or you decide, you know what, I could redeploy that cash a little better if I can maybe have the right people in place or systems in place or automation uh, or backend systems. And that's the route I decided to take is that I bet on, on automating, putting technology, putting backend systems, because if I could do that, I can, in the long run, I can absorb more orders because I could turn them around more quickly than scaling up a warehouse. Scaling up requires a lot more capital, a lot more people. And then if you invest in robots, it's a whole different story, but that also requires a lot of capital. Sure. So technology was, for me, the avenue to grow and to do that efficiently without tying up as much capital as possible. You know, as you continue to scale this business, when you're in this retail world, you can always expect on, there's always going to be a return. You know, first, if you're on Amazon, we need, you need to offer people some sort of sense of mind that, hey, listen, if this doesn't work out for you, you can return it. I think that's what a lot of people like about Amazon. They know that if they make a mistake, they can return it and they can do it from the comfort of their home. I don't. I don't see many shops that don't have some sort of a return policy. Sometimes there's a boutique that will say, you know, 10 days store credit only, whatever it might be. But I think for the folks that are really scaling out here in the e-commerce space, the more you sell, expect more returns. Now, we're, I, I think we're in a good space where the percentage of returns may not be as high as others. I think it was you that said clothing is one of those things that yeah, is. I mean, it's a, a lot of, high. a lot of, um, a lot of clothing, uh, especially clothing that um, where, where females buy, they'll buy two or three sizes to make Just sure to that they're um, they've got the right size on and they'll send the ones back that they don't need. Sure. I know that's the case here you know for my now i just yeah give me two or three so i'll i'll pick i'll get the right size oh yeah that's, that's the right one and then send back the rest but and we don't as consumers don't think about it but as a business um without the proper oversight without the proper systems in place without the proper visibility and then analytics to tell you hey things are piling up if this keeps going this way you're going to end up with, you know, X amount of cash tied up. And so having returns chew up profits is not a very glamorous thing. It's not a good thing. Uh, and it requires constant um, vigilance, really, uh, of course. over that piece of the business. Because uh, bo as I read, Circuit City ran into this issue. Radio Shack for sure ran into this issue. And, you know, in the toy business, you know, people do return stuff and, and people, you know, pile the inventory for Toys R Us piled up um, as well. So it requires a constant, constant monitoring 
of this because at any moment, and some of this is more cyclical, right? If you're in the toy business, you're probably going to get more shopping and done in certain parts of the year. Um, whereas maybe Radio Shack and Circuit City, their stuff is probably more level. And on a Black Friday, things probably go through the roof. But I don't think we had Black Friday in 2008. I would have to go check if we had that. <laughs> but uh, so being able to have visibility into that part of business that's not very glamorous instead of just sending stuff off to liquidation is a much better approach because you're better able to understand than on the front end when you're buying things where you need to hit the gas pedal or the brakes and that's where part of the feedback loop that sometimes doesn't get tied in the, then the folks handling the reverse logistics or returns or warehouse that information doesn't get back to the people that are buying right so now if you're a bigger business right imagine this dave you instead of being responsible for a million dollar worth of products that are being acquired you've got 10 million dollars or 30 million dollars or 50 million dollars if you're one of these larger organizations a mistake can cost at that level could be catastrophic. Oh yeah. Could be detrimental. It could also be detrimental to the small business where, you know, a million dollars or half a million dollars in inventory can sink you. But the mistakes are just magnified um, that much more when you're talking an organization that has multiple departments, multiple layers, uh, different offices, and and that could be just just a, just a fatal mistake that that could cost the operation and then think about the number of people that are part of an operation that are constantly buying right and if they don't get this feedback loop of right hit the brake pedals because the the cash flow is getting tight because of too much inventory because of things not selling as well as things being returned and then over time just think about that they've accumulated six months ten months a year two years four years five years six years and then you find yourself in a situation that Damon John was talking about. Right. Well, hey, you know, this, some of these folks, their, their job is to buy. Their job is oh, to yeah. buy. So if it's now time to not buy, well, the people that are doing that job, it's like, well, we don't know how to not buy things. We know how to buy things. So they, yeah, so they maybe rush and make split decisions. These, I know within the real t retail space, everyone tends to blame e-commerce and Amazon, but I wholeheartedly believe that Toys R Us, Circuit City, Radio Shack, just those three, they could have coexisted within the same marketplace. You don't always want to order online. Like I asked you earlier today, what was the last big appliance that you purchased? At, at a store? And that at was, a store. That was um, at Best Buy. I right. went in and looked at all the TV screens and I wanted to see side by side what they looked like, what the picture looked like. Yeah. And that's how I made the decision. That was probably like seven years ago. You know, I think a television is one of those. Th I've never bought a television online. I've done the exact same thing. I've made it a day of it, you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. like my parents used to lure me in to go into the mall by telling me that we're going to take, make a two second appearance at Toys R Us. My wife would say, Let's go out for lunch, and then after lunch, maybe we'll go look at TVs. It's like I want to, I want to look at some tech. I want to see what's on there. So mm -hmm. I think with something like that, it's nice. It still serves a purpose to go into a store. Now, someone might say, "Hey, Rolando, the stores were there so that you could go compare the models with your own eyes, mm -hmm. and then go home and order it on ABC.com, wherever wherever it might be." You know, and that's where the salesperson comes into play and they need to show their value so that they can sell their customer. It's just, a, it's a shame that some of these stores could have coexisted, but like you said, it's not good inventory management. Yeah, it's going to keep about, you away from this, trouble. Dave. I remember going into Circuit City and went before the end happened. And I was thinking, you know, is something wrong here? Because I remember a lot of shelves being empty and it wasn't a Black really? Friday. It was not on a one of these big shopping days there wasn't a lot of foot traffic as well. And those two things are not very good. And, and from what I see here, I've got, I'm just going to read you this, this clipping. It said, Circuit City failed to accurately forecast consumer trends and ended up stocking up on goods that were not in high demand. 
This led to a glut of unwanted products and significant losses when they were focused, I'm um, sorry, when they were forced to discount these items. Again, so profits got hurt because too much inventory, not the right one, not being able to forecast these. I, um, I almost have a love-hate relationship with the word forecast because that's what <laughs> everybody wants in this hardware industry. They want to know the forecast. But then ultimately, they were forced to discount those goods, which means that less profit. A business is in business to make profit. And if profits get eaten up because inventory and inventory management systems aren't up to, up, up to par, then in their case, it led, it, it, can, it just kind of pushed them over the edge, right? Right. Even though they had a big brand, that's the thing. The brand alone wasn't able to save them. And yeah, by 2007, 2008, uh, there were more online retailers and they, and then they were too late in the game uh, to be able to, to, to pivot. You know, you got to be able to also keep an eye on the future. Uh, All right. And that's what happens to some of these physical retail stores. Uh, and we've got a list of some other ones. Look at Radio Shack. I mean, Radio Shack dominated the electronic space for accessories. <laughs> I right. anytime, anytime I think of Radio Shack, everyone out there that might be listening, remember your last trip to Radio Shack. <laughs> Did they try to upsell you batteries? Yes. On your way out. I think, yes. I think if you didn't do that, you were put on a, um, a performance plan. And look at this. Look at what we're looking batteries. at. I know we're not listening to the audio, but if you're following us on the video side, look at all the celebrities that were on the, the Back to the Future, Hulk Hogan, Alf. Is that it Alf is or Elf? Alf. Alf. Yeah. Alf. Alien life form. Yes. Alf. And, um, oh, um, geez, what's the, the gymnast that was on there? Uh, go ahead, roll that again, Ori. Yeah, Mary, so, Lou. Mary Lou. <laughs> Mary Lou Retton. That's right. And, not all the store, a kid in yeah. play, <laughs> Chip, uh, uh, yeah, what's his man. name, Punch from, and is that, who's that, Twisted Sister? That was Twisted Sister, good call on Chucky, that. Chucky, Hulk Hogan, Hulk. Well, Mary Lou Retton, the, the Back to the Future, which was enormous. So, and I think this particular ad aired 2014. Is, am I right, Ori, the one that we're looking at? Well, I'm seeing a Twitter. It has a Twitter handle. Oh, maybe that. You know, I take that back. It says goodbye 80s. Right. So I think that was added on after, after. I think that was kind of a throwback type thing. But everyone that was in there, from the Hulk to Elf to Mary Lou Retton to Twisted D. Snyder from Twisted Sister. Who else did we see in that? Cliff Clavin from Kid and uh, Play. Kid right. Play. He had the big high top fade. Um, the Teen Wolf was in there. Yeah, uh, Chucky, Chucky was in there. These are all my. This is my childhood wrapped up in a commercial. I didn't know we were going way back like this today, man. Well, I loved a good radio. Remember that they'd have the stacks of uh, re remote control cars and uh, oh yes, uh, yeah. Uh, and you know what? That's the thing. That's the thing. Um, I was going to call you Ori. That Ori in my brain, Dave. There's some winners that they had, and that's the piece that I think it may have, may be harder for folks that have a physical store sometimes. Um, in the online space, this, this happens too. Picking the winners and then saying, hmm, wh what if we double down on this one and that one? Maybe get a white or black variation on it or a line extension where we make a smaller or a larger version of that. And that's usually what will keep on being of a cash cow. Sometimes you do have to take risks, right? And you're kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, those risks don't pay off, but then it's time to like cut the losses. We got to get rid of that or we're, less than, we're not going in that direction. That's not where our, like you're talking about RC. Look at that. If, if Radio Shack would have been able to stay in business, imagine if you can go to a Radio Shack where they have drones, right? You can oh, like drone. delivering for you, delivering for you. Oh, no, just the different types. Like, so, so people buy it. The, the rage right now is, is the uh, quadcopters, right? Oh, yeah. Right. So if you have, uh, and that's the thing now, and uh, the quadcopters and the different type people want to fly those. That's such a really hot, hot, hot thing. Um, and 
2015, it was probably a very small industry. I mean, look, you, but that you have to know where things are going as well as the, the things that are right in front of you, all the goods that we have. How can we sell them? How can we all, all that? And I think to a large extent that one, their website, I remember wasn't, wasn't great. Um, the other thing, um, <laughs> did, it, did it attach batteries when you were at the end of the No, but you know, the, the, when you're talking about the batteries and every company wants to upsell, right? Just like, do you want fries with that? But you're only as good as your weakest link. So I think about a football team, you know, I played football. So I think about if we have a center that is weaker than the guard and the tackles, they're going to get exposed and a quarterback's going to get hurt or me carrying the ball. I'm going to get hurt. So what do we got to do with that center against this team? So we, we don't get exposed. And I think that a lot of times organizations sometimes don't know the, the weakest part and they just ignore it. And if you're walking into a store and you're getting, you know, badgered as you're walking around, you want batteries all the time. You know what? Your experience isn't great. You don't love it. You're going to go somewhere else. And I think, that's where a self-examination of where you're good and where you're not um, and trying to amplify the things you're really good and create a bigger moat. And that's where organizations can excel. Um, but yeah, uh, Radio Shack, I mean, they had stores everywhere, everywhere, right. thousands of stores. Um, and so with thousands of stores, I remember once they went into the online space, not everything that you wanted was in the store. It was right. like, oh, it's online. Oh, what's online? Why can't I get it here? And so that that kind of aspect of like, I can't quite have a unified experience between on and offline. Um, and and understanding, I saw it over here, or I saw it in your store, I saw it online, which is now the more common thing. I saw it online and I can go pick it up, like at Best Buy and a lot of other places. So, understanding what the customer wants. I, if I see something on your, on your online shop, is there a way for me to go get it? And I think more retailers that are on the physical side are starting moving that direction and follow the lead of other folks like, like Best Buy and Home Depot and, and the rest. Yeah, retail retail is not dead. I mean, we've we obviously have some contenders out there that are doing a good job with inventory management. Um, but now I think we're seeing this trend of this mix of retail and online coming together. I'll tell you. So, we we have a Kohl's in town. Kohl's. I don't. I'm. I don't usually go shopping, but I do hear stories of my wife going to Kohl's. But half of the stories, she's going to Kohl's to make an Amazon return. So that's kind of cool, right? They, they bring in the person that's shopping online. They're making, they're making a return at a physical location. And then, if I'm not mistaken, Kohl's will then reward that person that walked into their store with a couple of dollars in Kohl's cash just to entice that person to shop. And I, I like what they're doing there. So their marketing idea was, hey, we'll help out with returns. We'll take your, we'll take your traffic. We'll, we'll manage your returns. Bring it into Kohl's. Hey, customer, while you're here, here's a couple of bucks. Come mm -hmm. shop in our store. Pretty mm -hmm. good idea, huh? Very, very good idea. I mean, that, that's what Amazon's doing with Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why they've made the returns there free. Now, get this, Dave. Let's do a Ori. Wake up and give me a pro tip. Here comes a pro tip. If you think the party with three returns is going to last forever and you're a business, I'm talking now for businesses that are selling product, the party is going to end. Um, Amazon has already signaled that or returns, they are going to charge. They've already started that. Uh, not all returns, but this is the beginning. This is only the beginning. They're charging for returns. And so if you're returning something through the UPS store, they're going to charge you for it. Now, I would expect that, uh, I should, let, me, let me rephrase that. I would imagine 
that one of the reasons that Amazon is doing this is that returns are eating into the profit. And they eat into the profits of every organization, no matter what you're selling. And at, I think at some point, the customer is going to, they A, are going to say, well, we're going to stop shopping on Amazon, which I don't really see that happening, especially based on last quarter's numbers where they killed it. Uh, or they say, okay, this is part of life now. I've got to think about the easy, just like, ah, I don't like it. I, I think the customer behavior around this is going to change over time, Dave, because if businesses are saying, you know, hey, every 1% of profit that I can uh, get under control adds up over time, then returns is that part where, you know, Amazon made it easy to return. Everybody went to free returns. Amazon's now reintroducing, hey, there's a fee for a return. I think other companies are going to follow suit and see how they can introduce that. Others may see it as an opening to say, hmm, Amazon, you're a bad guy. You're charging for returns. <laughs> what are you thinking? But Amazon's big enough where they can influence the behavior. Only time will tell, Dave, if Amazon's approach is the way to go. There's there's people that take advantage of Amazon returns. I had watched a podcast recently, and one of the one of the hosts was giggling as he's admitting to buy to buying his wardrobe on Amazon with full intention of returning everything that he was buying. So he was in this circle of buying outfits, wearing outfits, <laughs> ordering more clothing mm -hmm. while he's returning clothing. And it was just, he's like, I had a full wardrobe for a year. I didn't pay for it at all. And then oh. they said, they said that's uh, is that not a violation of Amazon's policies? He said, no, I actually got kicked off of Amazon for doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. So he got kind of found, but what I guess what I meant to say is, yes, you have these people that are taking advantage of it, but I think as consumers, Amazon has removed the weariness that we should all have before making a purchase, before I'm buying something. You do enough of your own research so that you're making the right decision. And I think what Amazon has done for some product categories is just taking away the responsibility from the consumer to do any homework themselves, mm -hmm. go buy it, see if it works or not, see if it fits or not, and then decide from there. And I just feel there's this level of responsibility that's been removed. Um, we sell high ticket items. We want, we want our customers to, to obviously be thrilled with what they purchased from us, but we also don't want customers to haphazardly buy a high ticket item and say, I'll figure yeah, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's like, Hey, there is a business at the other end of this. And some of these businesses aren't billion dollar organizations. You know, well, you know Dave, I think some of what you're saying as well. And one of the frustrations as a customer, if I put myself in, in, my, in the customer role and shoes of that, when I get a product and I'm not sure what to do, you can say, ah, hell with it. I'm going to return it. But I think a lot of people don't have very good options. I know I've tried with multiple companies to get in touch with them. And the mm -hmm. phone number to get in touch with them is hidden. It's somewhere on their website, but so hard to find. It's, you know, three, five, six, seven clicks deep into <laughs> the support. Do you really want support? Do you? <laughs> da, 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 da. And uh, you've yeah. made it so hard that you know, forget it. I'm saying it back. Uh, or you manage to get online. And here's the part that I absolutely hate. You get somebody either to chat with or on the line and they can't fix it in the first phone call. Like, what? I got to wait for you to open up a case with the tech, the tech, a tech, a tech, a tech, a day or two go by. Yeah, forget it. I'll just return. Yeah, by that time, the, uh, the return has been requested. The yeah. A to Z button has been hit. <laughs> exactly. And so, and that's what's happened. That's what happened. And what you just say is so true. You hit A to Z because, you know, in the case of Amazon, they're going to uh, authorize the return. If 
but Amazon now has, you know, realized, hey, there's abuse going on. And so like you're saying, they're kicking bad actors off. They, they know, they know from what I understand, they know the return rate of what it should be within the category. So if you as an individual are returning double, triple that amount, they are going to flag your account for suspension. Right. And so what, 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 we, what you were saying was, yeah, you get returns. And in some cases, if you don't have a very easy way to let customers see videos, a, a knowledge base, a support team, or, and, or be able to take action when a customer calls and says, hey, I'm having a problem here. Can you help me? If, it, if that interaction goes south, where that person is not able to help them on the first call or the first email, you increase your odds of the return going back to your organization flat out. Uh, the easier it is, whether it's a self-service option to consume videos or information, along with easy to find support that is empowered to make a decision on a product and why it's not working or to help that person get over the problem, then if that all doesn't fall in line, then you real really will have a problem. Because imagine thousands of orders, uh, Dave, over time, and it just starts, things just start coming through the back end and through the warehouse. And now you've got a big problem because just incrementally over time, all these little orders started piling up. And you need to get in front of it. You know, we, you were talking earlier about it's not the it's not the sexiest part of the business, but I almost think it kind of is. <laughs> if you go into this knowing, listen, we're going to scale. We have more listings. Our sales are growing. Listen, we're 20% over last quarter, 20% over the quarter over that. We're going to keep going. All right, so now we examine returns. All right, returns are 7%. Uh, it's, the more we sell as we can continue to grow, even if we just stay at 7%, we're going to be loading up with this. Get in front of it now. Make it just as fun as the strategy of creating the best listing. The, you know, yeah. put that support piece in it. And if you're ignoring it, perhaps your returns aren't an issue. Um, each category is slightly different. I'd be interested. I would love to find the folks that have 0% or 1% return rate. I don't think it exists unless... Maybe you sell an item that's so low cost that it might be one of those, what do they call that? A returnless refund type yeah, thing, yeah. which is a different story, but a, a strategy nonetheless. Yeah, it's that a comes strategy. With yeah. like web data. Um, but when we put things in place to support the client, to make the client know, listen, we're not going to tell this customer, we don't want you to return your product. That's not our angle. Our angle is you bought a product. You were trying to solve a problem. You still need help solving this problem because it's a little bit tricky to set up. Here's our phone number at the front, at, right at the top. Yeah, that's, that's, that is a pro tip within itself, Dave. Put your support information at the very top, front and center. Don't hide it. Um, you just, you just help yourself. You know, I know that I won't call this particular company out because, you know, I just won't do that, but, um, they're much, 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 much larger organization that sells electronics. And one of the things that you can do as a consumer, as a business, if you want to know if these, um, if this, if the particular entity you're trying to buy from does a good job of it on Amazon, every company gets rated. Um, and there's a rating for it, uh, from all their consumer feedback. There's the product side that has, you know, the actual product feedback. And then there's um, feedback that's uh, particular to the entity you're buying. So on Amazon, you may, you may buy something, but you're buying it through a third party like ourselves or something else. And what I was stunned, Dave, to find out that this really large electronics entity has a very mediocre rating online when it comes to consumers providing feedback on their customer support or lack thereof. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not a lack of resources. It's just a, it's, it's just when you get the problem, how are you addressing it? Are they empowered to fix it? Or, you know, what, what we've done that's helped a lot is when we get those customer returns, you know, we go, we, we go over them, you know, what are they saying? Well, they said that, you know, the uh, cable that came with it, 
is not clear or they don't understand, or they may say some variation of that. And sometimes that is the signal, the bat signal to, okay, how can we make the product we're selling um, either more visible or that aspect that is causing the problem to be more visible? Hmm. And it's it maybe as simple as an insert or as simple as a QR code or as simple as on the website when they order it to make it very clear, this product, you need to do X and then it turns on. How, you know what the number one of the number one searches is for electronics products that have Bluetooth is how to pair. <laughs> number two, yeah. how to mute. Number three, how to turn it on. I can't kid you not. Look, you just look at, do a search for a particular electronics device, you know, how to turn on your iPhone, for example, how to turn off, how to mute, you know, a, a headset, how to pair, how to, you will find an inordinate amount of videos online for those three things. That's crazy. Yeah. And, so, so what was your suggestion? Something like, I like what you were saying, like an insert, something simple. An, an insert, uh, certainly a video, because people are reading less. I'm, I'm guilty of that myself, mm -hmm. where I'm online, I want to look at something, and, and I want to see myself turning it on, knowing what's in the box, which is, you see a lot of those unboxing. But that's where a lot of videos end, Dave. They end at the unboxing. Okay, now I know what I'm getting. It's the more complicated, obviously, if it's something very simple, like, you know, supplements or something like that. Okay. Maybe a suggestion on how to use it, but for things that get more complex and more involved, how do I use it? Mm -hmm. How do I operate it? Um, how do With I images, plug it in? Right. You know, give me some images, make it easy. You know, I right. don't know. I don't know if some of these brands still do it, but some of these, some of these international brands, they would include a user manual. Mm -hmm. Um, in 20 different languages. So when you took it and you opened it and you just kept opening it and opening it, <laughs> and, opening it and English was only, you know, your language was only this little section of it, but you were so intimidated. You're like, nope, this is why men don't read instructions, throw it away. And then you go online and just something simple. But I've seen some brands, um, I'm looking at a box right here. I'm not going to grab it, but I bet if I look in the inside of this new product that we got mm -hmm. from EPOS, I'm going to call them out. If I open up this box right on the inside of the box, it's not going to, it's not even a, la I, don't, I bet it's not even a language. I bet they just communicate with pictures and icons. Yes, absolutely. And like talk about making things easy, keeping costs low, saving a little bit of garbage in a landfill, always like that. Um, but yeah, it's always been that tricky piece. How do you, so your customers made the purchase. That's great. You don't want them returning that. You've worked so hard for that sale. Mm -hmm. You're not at the end of your journey. Yeah. You tell no, me a good one. It's a full life cycle, Dave. You know, when you full, think about it, you've got, you got the customer buying you, you as an entity buying more of that inventory, you storing it and managing it and fulfilling it and shipping it. And then you have this right the the maybe the tail end part of that life cycle is how do we manage the end right whatever the end means whether it's a return whether it's disposal whether it's recycle whether it's donations or liquidations there is a component that is the end <laughs> and it's not always the most fun but there's it's an important part of the mix and and, and it's so important I mean, if we're, if we're talking about products that were returned, that's money sitting, sitting, sitting. It's money sitting, sitting yeah. there. Yeah. It's, money, it's just money sitting there. What's important is to have the right data so that you can make those next steps. Absolutely. And con connecting those dots. And, you know, when I think about where the dots need to be connected next, Dave, I think the hockey puck is going in a direction that's slightly different than in the past and other companies have tried uh to do some of this um uh, what, what where the media world social media um and 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 things that are online that are that are that are media that can be consumed and commerce let me give you some examples on youtube today you will see that youtube has an integration with Shopify that allows some content creators to show merchandise or other items. That wasn't the case before. 
Um, on the Amazon side, Amazon does have their Prime Video, but that's more for movies and that kind of thing. But from the e-commerce side of things, they're trying to uh, incorporate more influencers. They have an app that's more influence based. I think if they're really going to make some noise, they would they would probably need to leverage uh, another platform or or partner with another because they don't have that social media piece um, like YouTube or right. TikTok, which I want to also highlight. They're also getting into this play where you've got the media side, the social media side converging. Now they've got TikTok shop done phenomenal in other parts of the of the country uh, of the world outside the U.S. But now they're making an effort here in order to to merge those two worlds of e-commerce and media. Now, there's two things that really need attention on that to see if they're going to be successful. One, are they putting resources? And they are. They are hiring a lot of people, paying them well. They are. Um, they have facilities and they have their own seller central, their own TikTok seller central. So a lot of things like Amazon in order to try to get to that piece where Amazon dominates, which is the logistics, the fulfillment, getting you the item when you need it fast and quick. And so in this new landscape, it is going to be very interesting to see what TikTok's, what TikTok does and influences on the e-commerce side, because what they've done on the media side is they forced all the media companies to go to shorts and go to clips mm -hmm. and go to short form video. All of them have placed an emphasis, Insta, Facebook, YouTube, all right? All of them have, uh, have tried to, that Snapchat, all of them have tried to deliver this short form experience. So they've changed that, the, the game. It's interesting to see what's going to happen on the, on the e-commerce side, because now if I'm a consumer, I'm watching a video of some sort and I like it. I like my influencer or I like the personality that I'm watching and consuming this video. I want to support them or what's I your feeling the organization. But what's your feeling about sponsored ads versus organic stuff that pops up in your feed? Well, it, um, I, you know, because I, te it, it I tend to be it, less attracted to some of the sponsored stuff. So the, so the, the promotional ads, I, I think it's a mixed bag, Dave, you've got uh, some companies doing, really well. You know, we had John Morgan Stern uh, from VaynerMedia, which is Gary Vee's company. And he gave us a, so if, go check out that episode with John Morgan Stern, by the way, he had a lot of good insights, but the, the algorithms um, are getting to the point where Dave Kelly, the person, when he goes on Facebook, as well as when he goes on TikTok or Instagram, it knows what you've, what you've clicked on, what you've watched. And now the uh, backend AI to all these algorithms are to a point from what John Morgenstern was telling us. They know you so well that they will serve up uh, this type of creative ad. The next one is going to be this one. The next one is going to be this one. And oh, you clicked on this fourth one. It was about software editing. Let's serve him up more software editing. And you may not even click on the other ones, but there's something about the creative aspect of, of an ad. And that's something that is a data point that gets fed back into the algorithms. And so what John was telling us is, hey, the algorithms do a better job than you now as a human, as a buyer, trying to place bets on here, 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 and here, that they know your interests and they're feeding you interests both on the organic as well as sponsored. And so now, that's where at some point, that's why TikTok's so good. It keeps serving you what you want, <laughs> right? That's why it's so addictive. And the one platform that has the highest watch time of any of the other ones right now, right? So the, the algorithms are getting better and better under understand their human psychology to some extent, right? And you're specific personalizing to you, Dave. <laughs> yeah, right, they kind of like at... cookies. So we're going to give you more, more videos of people making or baking, Why? making I, cookies. I, you know, I all talk, talking I, I about think... ingredients, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it. My feed has me. They they know me too well. <laughs> I don't like. I, I it's like I like it and I don't like it. But it's weird. I'll find myself watching something pretty sophisticated, right? 
And then I'll have the dumbest thing ever jump in front of me right after. I'm like, all right, so I'm entertained by lowbrow humor and, you know, very scientific studies. Right. I would think the algorithm's like, I don't know if I should be giving this guy a chemistry set or <laughs> um, some band-aids because he's going to walk into a, he's going to walk into a door or something. He doesn't, doesn't seem extremely uh, intelligent, that one. Well, but, yeah, but, the, but, but think about that. You, you, let's say out. you're into cookies and there are companies that sell cookies and they have ads for cookies. You may not necessarily go after the first ad or the second ad, but the third one catches your attention because maybe they're, they're more scientific about the way they are doing their cookies or because they they're more humor better. based, right? right? You know, ha ha ha, I, I burnt my cookies, blah, blah, but if you use this wonderful tool, it'll never burn, right? Mm, that's again, a data point. And yep. The um, I think Chat GPT is up to a, a trillion data points. So the the amount of of power that's behind these algorithms is getting exponentially larger. The ability to connect all these different dots, and so that's why I think as we move forward, that media play where they where they understand the consumer really well. They know what you like, Dave. They know what you like to consume. Can I get you? to click on an ad that has a greater likelihood. You know, you're never going to hit a hundred. You're playing the probabilities when you're talking algorithm. What's the probability we can get Dave to click on this? And what's the probability Dave is then going to buy? And you're playing those numbers out. Amazon does this on all the social media platforms do it. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the TikTok experience is going to play out because e-commerce is not their thing. That's Amazon. Yep. You could throw Walmart in there, although Walmart's are very far behind. They're a number two player in the e-commerce space, and but they're further behind. But they're really good at logistics. You know, how's the FBA ish situation? Because fulfilled by TikTok is not going to be the same as fulfilled by Amazon, right? That's where right. where Amazon could get you something now today. I've I've started seeing on on Amazon. I can get some. Oh, it says delivery by nine p.m. today. I'm like, great. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't try to upsell you batteries. <laughs> but so they, what, they, no, but they they try to sneak in something. Other things you may be interested in. They do. Yeah, I'm I'm starting to see that now. Though, what did we get recently? Oh, you know what? I think it it may have been one of those food programs. Like a um, like a meal plan type of thing. Yeah, meal plan. I can't quite remember, but in the box it was like, um, hey, try try some of these energy bars. And uh, have you tried this? It, they just gave you like a couple of samples with mm -hmm. some coupons. And hope sounds like what you, Kevin King told us too. Driving. He said something like that. That you know the thing that he sells, and and the best sellers he'll send a sampler package. Yeah, uh, bundled in with some of the other right, items right. to see if you can get uh, if you get hooked on some of the the little um, sampler items and then buy and make a purchase on those other items as well. Hey, you're trying to make um, repeat customers and fans. Hey, if you can get that repeat customer, that's a pretty big deal. That, no doubt. And so we're, we, we're, we're talking about Walmart uh, and, you know, you got to throw eBay. I don't know what's going to happen, you know, with with eBay there. They've found a niche in the automotive side and, um, you know, they're hanging on somewhere, you know, I think the space is going to get very crowded if things go in this direction where the media companies and e-commerce either merge, converge, or the media companies muscle their way in as a, like what TikTok, they're, they're, they're not partnering with anybody. They're doing it solo. It's gonna have to eat into something, you know. The pie isn't an unlimited pie, you know. I I, I could see maybe um, an entity that's looking for an e-commerce play and buying eBay. That could be very yeah, interesting sure. uh, because they come in with the infrastructure and software and people and know-how, uh, and now maybe a retailer that didn't have that infrastructure is set up for that. Although eBay doesn't have fulfillment centers. Ultimately, I think it comes down to that. Dave, back to the original thing. Fulfillment, inventory, returns. How do you manage that? eBay doesn't do that. They're not involved in that. It's on this individual seller on eBay. But being able to have that ecosystem where it's a closed loop and you manage it in a way where 
it's managed well, not just managed, but managed well, like a Walmart, like an Amazon and taking those examples of what they do well and then incorporating it. I think that's the winning formula. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to what happens to just a pure media uh, or pure e-commerce. I think there's still room for a lot of folks, but as these other players converge those two worlds, it's going to get harder for those that are on the edge or the per or periphery to excel. Now, hold up. Something went kablooey on my end. Oh, that was weird. Um, so that's that's what I think will happen. It'll it'll be interesting. Um, this stuff could happen overnight. Uh, sometimes things take a little while for for them to shake out. But I, I think we keep an eye on TikTok and see how they're able to shape the landscape. We keep an eye on Amazon because they have a lot of influence. Um, there's a there's a there's a possibility that they're going to be taken into court by an antitrust lawsuit. Uh, it's being thrown around a lot in the media. So at the time of this airing, we'll see uh, what happens, you know, a year or two from now, if that forces uh, change on the Amazon side. I don't know. It's going to get really interesting here the next six to eight months. Yeah, I would say. And I would also say, listen, if you're an Amazon seller out there that's been in it for 10 years or you're just getting going or maybe you're a 20 year old, 20 vet, 20 year veteran, I guess that's not possible. 99. When was Amazon? Nine, around Amazon 99. Started? I think 99. 99. All right. So there could potentially be some 20 year old sellers out there. What I'm hearing, Rolando, is listen, if you're an e commerce retailer, full service retailer, um, or you're just dabbling in it, you might want to also think about a media team and um, your social media play because it won't all reside right here on Amazon. You know, John Morgenstern's talking about. AI and the different data points from all of the places you're at, which could influence that Amazon sale when, when your buyer eventually gets there. Man, there's, there's a lot. Um, it's this living, breathing animal. There's so many different parts of being successful on Amazon and e-commerce. Um, you really can't let your guard down for a minute, can you? No. To think, think about just to rewind the clock a little bit. Back in the day, you either send stuff by direct mail, you put in a billboard, or you tried to get something in the phone book and you called yourself A1 Super Plumbing, right? Because you're at the very Quadruple top. A Plumbing. Oh, yeah, wow. Quadruple A, <laughs> right? Those people still send direct mail. Phone book, gone, right? That's pretty much the dodo bird. Um, billboards, they're still around. You know, they, they have some value, but... Um, and my point is that you had an omni channel back in the day, and that was your omni channel. I guess you had radio and TV. The omni channel now is some of that, but a whole lot of social because more and more, I think the latest stat says something like 40% of searches for Gen X and Z all come, uh, or, or Gen Y. I, 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 I always kind of screw those two up. Um, the younger kids. Uh, up to the age of 30, 40% are starting their searches on TikTok. Amazing stat. So Google has taken notice on that. And I think we're not going to go backwards when it comes to the consumption of media and where people start their search. Um, and I think having a well-rounded omni-channel strategy, as we said from our friend from VaynerMedia, uh, John, big props to you for, for coming on and letting us know how all this is shaking out is that, you know, there's going to be more decisions made around what people consume online. And then ultimately, the click that comes as a result um, from consuming that social media. All right. Amazing stuff. Well, Rolando, it was a really good conversation today. I know it was just the two of us. We'll be bringing on some more guests in the near future. But in the meantime, tell, tell them where they can see uh some of our other episodes. Who was our? Who did we want to give a um, a shout out to or a closing? Yeah, you know, if you like, episode. if you want to nerd out on what's happening in the Amazon world uh, or in e-commerce, we talked to Kevin King, Dave, who is probably one of those foremost sought-out consultants as well. He's a seller. He's still selling uh, when it comes to uh, online products. And we had him on our show and he came in, and gave us a whole bunch of nuggets 
And so if you want to learn more about how to excel in a very competitive world as an online seller, as a full service uh, retailer, go ahead and check out the Kevin King episode. And we've got all of that action on circuitloops.com as well as wherever you consume your podcast. So I want to thank you for joining us today on this episode. And Dave and I will see you the next time in that episode.